In this video, I'm taking this massive log and turning it into a fiery work of art, complete with its own outdoor furniture. And then I'm escaping the cold darkness of winter by turning my shop into a warm, sandy, tropical oasis. So to start off this build, I have this log that's been sitting outside my dad's shop for a few months. It took me a little while to find a log like this, I basically needed it as wide and as straight and symmetrical as possible. After talking to a few places, one of my friends had one of these ash logs sitting in the yard and it was about as straight and good as I could find anywhere. And it only cost me a few hundred bucks. So I have to get this over to my shop, which is about a 10 minute drive by car away, so I'm just using some of the equipment my dad has sitting in the yard right now to juggle this over there. So I have this set on some 5x5 five five beams and I'm just putting some blocking on both sides of the log just so this doesn't roll away. And then I took a crappy little low pressure pressure washer just to give this a good rinse off. So after everything dried up, I took a 3 ton car jack and just jacked up the end of the log so that I could level the beams underneath. Once the log was sitting level, I could use this laser level to draw my cut lines at each end of the log. This took a little bit of tinkering and really just eyeballing to get these ends both parallel to each other and perpendicular to the log. Luckily it is a really big log, it's almost 28 inches wide, so a little bit of inconsistency isn't going to be that big a deal. But now I'm ready to cut off these ends. So I used a 32 inch chainsaw I borrowed from a friend to make the cut on both ends and it cut through that log like butter. It also cut through other stuff like butter, like this beer can. So now I'm making up the legs that are going to hold this log. So I have this 2 by 4 inch by 1 8 inch thickness steel tubing. And I'll just be cutting this tube in with some 45 degree angles to basically make a square. So with my cheap and handy chop saw, I just set the fence with a 45 degree angle using my square. And then started cutting through my tubing. Also this 14 inch blade wasn't quite big enough to cut through this tubing, so I just finished up the cut with an angle grinder. With all the cuts made, I just use an angle grinder to clean up the edges and also grind away any inconsistencies so that the 45 degrees fit together as nice as I could make them. With a good rough fit, I got out my flux core welder, 
And this is just a really cheap welder I got on sale at Canadian Tire and I've been using it for years. A lot of people think you need the best tools to build cool stuff and that is absolutely not true. Almost every tool I have is some cheap bargain deal. So I used a welding magnet just to hold the corner square while I started welding. And then I just went around the frame completing the welds. I'm not the world's prettiest welder, but I can weld fairly structurally, and that's really all that matters, because I'm going to grind these down anyway. So with one of my squares fully welded, I just got out a grinding disc for my angle grinder and just grinded these flush. So I based the size of the square off the width of the log, so I'm just measuring this up again so that I can make one little piece of steel that goes right on the bottom portion of the square and basically holds the log up so that I don't have to suspend the full weight of the log with just a threaded rod or some bolts. It'll actually just be resting on this steel piece and have some bolts just to keep it from falling off. So I cut up a custom sized piece for each end. And then I just trace the end of this onto another scrap piece of steel and cut out this portion just to have a plate so I can cap this end. So then I went ahead and welded that plate onto one end of the tubing. and gave it a good grind with my angle grinder. So this piece is going to sit right in the middle of the bottom section of my leg and I'll just weld it into place right there. Like I said before, I measured this to make it a custom size so that when the log's sitting on top of this, it'll be suspended right in the middle of this opening of the square. Now that's one leg fully constructed and I'm just going to take a 120 grit sanding disc in my angle grinder and just go over the entire thing with this sanding disc. This will get rid of any final imperfections and rust and just make it smooth to the touch and accept the paint a lot better. So now that I have one leg pretty much ready to go, I have to build another one the exact same. And now with both of these done, before I take them over to paint, I'm just going to flip them onto their side. And then measure out the center point and drill through a pilot hole with a small drill bit. And then drill through with a half inch drill bit. I'm drilling these holes through both sides of the steel so that I can pass some bolts clean through here and use them to position the log. I have some big long galvanized bolts that I'm going to use for this, but we'll get to that in a second. First, it's time to paint these legs. So I just have some regular trim clad primer and I'm first gonna prime the steel. I did a few really thin coats of primer and you can actually get a really professional look even just with this regular trim clad spray paint. Really all you have to do is just know that it's gonna take you a few coats and that way you don't overload the paint and get a bunch of runs. This stuff dries up pretty quick so you can do another coat like 10 minutes later. And with the primer fully done, I just have some semi-gloss black and that's gonna be my finished color. So at this point in the build, I actually took a week to go to Sedona, Arizona, and I know what you're thinking. I didn't go on this vacation, so who gives a shit? And I agree, I'm not going to talk about it a ton, but some of the drone footage looks so good that I just had to show it to somebody. So here's some of it. You guys are really the only people that think what I do is awesome, so let me know in the comments below if you want more outtakes of just my regular life in these videos. And now back to reality. So before I install these legs, I'm just drilling a hole in the bottom and then installing these rubber feet. 
You also notice I drilled a wee pole here before I painted, that's just to let any water out that happens to make its way inside of the steel tubing. So to install a leg, first I jacked up the log with the car jack, and then I just slipped the leg over the end and let the log rest down on that pedestal I welded on. Then I spent a good amount of time measuring and making sure this was as square to the log as possible and that the log was shooting right down the middle of the square. So now I have these half inch by 10 inch galvanized leg bolts. So first I took a quarter inch drill bit and just drilled a pilot hole for this bolt. And then I started screwing in the bolt with my impact. This is one of the rare occurrences that this like eight year old $50 impact didn't have the torque that I needed it to, so I just finished this up with the hand wrench. And yeah, yeah, DeWalt and Milwaukee are better, I don't care. So that pedestal actually takes all the way to this log and then these bolts are really just to hold it in place so it doesn't fall off of that pedestal. My original idea was gonna to be to use threaded rod and pass a hole clean through the log and actually suspend it with the threaded rod, but I figured this pedestal and bolt method would be a lot easier and a lot less pressure on me to drill a perfectly straight 30 inch hole through a log. So now it's time to give this log some fire. So I have this 60 inch by 8 inch propane fireplace insert that I'm gonna carve into this log. So after getting the piece as centered as I could, I went around with a permanent marker and just traced the outside cut edge. And then to cut this out, I'm gonna use a bunch of passes with my 12 inch battery powered chainsaw I got for Christmas. A gas powered chainsaw would probably make this process a lot quicker and easier, but this little electric thing cut it through it actually surprisingly well. So the idea of this is I'm cutting this wood into a bunch of thin strips inside of that tracing. And after a couple passes, I have these cuts a couple inches deep and then I can come back with a hammer and chisel and start removing these pieces. The first couple are always the hardest to get out, but after that you have a little more room to work and you can pop the rest out fairly quickly. It's a pretty quick way to remove a lot of wood material in short order. Carving this whole thing out took probably a couple hours. So after my first pass of chiseling, I did a rough fit with the insert just to make sure we were on track. And then I started doing the exact same thing again just to deepen up this trench. After three passes, I had this probably four inches deep, and that should be deep enough for the majority of this trench. So now I wanna level out the rim to make the insert sit more flush with the log. So I propped up this laser level, and then I'm just using a permanent marker to trace that line. Now I'm going to use a sanding disc on my angle grinder and I'm just going to go around sanding down this edge until I have it flush with that permanent marker line. This was a pretty time consuming process and probably the messiest thing I've done since I routed out the LED lights in my lava table. This makes a really fine dust that got to every single corner of my shop.
But after probably 45 minutes or so of sanding this down, I have a pretty flush fit with that insert now. So now I want to install this control plate so that I can ignite the fire and control the propane flow right from this panel. So I marked out its positioning and then I'm just carving this back in with the 12 inch chainsaw so that there's basically just like this thin plate of wood that this mounting plate will be mounted onto. With that dug out, I just used a spade bit to blast through that wall where I needed to. Then with a quick leveling of the bark, that mounting plate sits on here pretty flush. One last thing before we install the insert. I have this one inch by 30 inch ship auger bit that I was actually gonna use to drill through the threaded rod when I was planning to do that. But now it's gonna work perfectly to drill some holes through this log for ventilation and to pass the propane line through. So I just use a good high torque impact and that ate through this pretty quickly. Now the tough work on this log is done and I'm just gonna prepare this insert for install. So these inserts come with specific directions per model so I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail but basically I just installed the provided fittings in the order they said. I also installed the spark igniter. And then this grounding wire also has to be installed somewhere along the pan, so I just used one of the bolts of the spark igniter and bolted it on there. Then I can plug in the two wires from the igniter over to the button and install that in the mounting plate and we have spark. Next I can install the propane flow control valve. So I just threaded that into its position in the mounting plate and then this key will be used to control the flow. And basically one hose will be screwed in here that supplies the pan with propane after the valve and the other side will get the supply hose straight from the propane tank. Now let's install that all inside the log. Just a couple finishing touches before this fire log thing is fully done. I used some leftover UV protection oil to oil up the ends and the top so they don't gray off so quickly. And it gives them a little more vibrance in life. By the way, this oil came from my tiny house exterior build video and there's a ton of people asking me when I'm going to be working on that again and once this video is out, I'll be starting the interior of that. And finally, I added in some amber colored fire glass. So now I'm going to be making a patio set to go with this table and to start off I have these clear cedar 4x4s. And 4x4s are 3.5 inches but I'm actually going to plane this down in width and bring it to about 3 inches just so that it doesn't look like a standard stockyard 4x4. Anybody that builds stuff knows the rough dimension of a 4x4 and a 2x4 just by eye. So if I plane it down to 3 inches it's going to look a lot more like a custom piece of wood rather than just a 4x4. This is really just personal preference, you wouldn't have to plane these at all, you could just use the 4x4s as is if you wanted. But hey, you know me, I love doing extra work. So after probably about 12 passes with the planer rotating on each pass, I had the 4x4 down to a width that I liked, which was right at about 3 inches. And now I just have to do this to the 11 other 4x4s.
So after about an hour and a half of planing, those are all planed up, and now I'm just taking a board and cutting a fresh end. And then I'm measuring out my first piece. So this piece is going to have a 45 degree angle, so I adjusted my miter saw. And then I just started a little bit outside and inched up on that line to complete a perfect cut. I also have a 60 tooth finish cut blade in my miter saw and that's going to save me a lot of time for not having to sand or deal with any wood blowout. So take the 30 seconds and change out your blade, I used to be worse than anybody for that. So now I have an 8th inch roundover bit in my palm rotor and I'm just going to go around the four edges of these pieces. This is barely any round over at all, it's really just an alternative to a hand sand edge, but it looks a lot more consistent and professional. And it's quicker. So these first three pieces are going to connect together in this U shape. So to connect them, first I'm marking out some hole placement with my square. And then I'm using a 3 8 inch Forstner bit just to countersink these holes a half inch or so. And before joining them, I gave all the pieces a good sand with some 120 grit. And now I can apply some weather resistant wood glue to my first piece. To fasten these rigidly and really clamp down the glue, I'm just using some 3.5 inch number 10 deck screws. And with that done, I'm measuring out and then cutting up one more piece of 4x4 to be a cross member. So I designed these patio chairs to be pretty beginner friendly and you can probably build them at home if you have basic tools like a drill and impact, miter saw, sander and table saw. The planer and router are an added bonus but they're completely optional, you could easily do this without. These chairs look pretty slick in the end so if you're looking for a new challenge I'd try and make these yourself this spring. The plans are out for free on my website and there's no better feeling than completing something you didn't think you were able to. Believe me, it's kind of my whole job. One more thing I'm going to do, and I did it in my last few videos so I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, but I kept all the offcut pieces of the 4x4s, and then I have this dowel cutting drill bit that I'm using in my drill press to cut out some dowels using the exact lumber that's in the legs. These dowels can then be broke out and glued into the holes with some wood glue, and I used a little bit of extra sawdust just to fill in the gaps. And then after this dries for an hour or two, I can come back and cut it off with my oscillating tool. And sand the dowel flush for a pretty sleek connection. I just love the look of no exposed fasteners. It takes quite a bit more work, but in the end it looks a lot more like a high-end project. Which it is. So with my second leg made up, I can start on making my seat and backrest. So all the lumber for this I'm going to be cutting out of some clear 2x4s I have left over from my sauna build. So using my table saw, I'm just ripping the rounded edge off, and then cutting the 2x4 into two 1.5 inch squares. These are now just essentially clear 2x2s. Two and after I have a bunch of them cut up, I can start assembly. So I cut some pieces with some 45 degree miters and I'm basically just assembling this rectangle. 
So I just glued up the joints and screwed them together with those same deck screws and I didn't have to countersink these deck screws at all because the chair legs are going to cover these up. Then I gave the piece a good sand and I should have did this when it was all individual pieces but I'll do that moving forward. Then I cut up a bunch of these same length 2x2s and sanded them and routed them so they're ready for install. To assemble these pieces I'm going to be screwing them in using some pocket holes. So I have this handy little clamp down jig that makes drilling pocket holes super quick and easy. I basically just clamp this down on the end of the piece and then using the provided drill bit and two of the hole templates I just drill in two pocket holes. Easy as that. And I did this to both ends of all of these pieces. Now I just marked out some even spacing and started screwing these pieces into place. With that all assembled, I gave the piece a quick sand, and that's a finished seat. Now I'm just making up one more of these the exact same way with slightly different dimensions that's going to be the backrest. And all the pieces for this chair are done, let's start assembly. So with one of the legs laid out flat, I put the seat portion in place. And I just align this on a little bit of an angle so it has a more natural sitting position than if it was flat. And then I just screwed the seat right into the leg using some 3 inch deck screws and I used probably 7 or 8 of these because they're going to be taking all the load of the seat. Then I added on the second leg in the exact same way just upside down and stood it up. So I cut up three more sections of 2x2 two two and just screwed them in along the back section of the seat like so. And now I can pop in this backrest and I just kind of fidgeted around with it until it had an angle that seemed right. Minus the finish and the cushions, that's one completed chair. Now I'm building up one more chair in the exact same way. And just some inside perspective on how long it takes to film these videos, the chair I just showed you where I filmed the entire time took me almost two full days to build. And then building this second chair where I just did the odd time lapse here and there took me only half a day. And that's pretty common, stuff definitely takes way longer when you're filming. So hey, go ahead, try to copy these videos. And now for the bench, I'm building up my last two legs in the exact same way. And then this bench will be built pretty much the same way as the chairs with some key differences and I'll go over those right now. So for the backrest, I framed out this longer rectangular shape, and then it has this ripped piece of 2x4 that cuts it right down the middle. After that, I just installed some more 2x2 spindles, the same way with those pocket hole screws. Oh, and one other note, when I showed you how to build the chair, I only had these zinc plated screws, but I really should have had these blue coat screws. The zinc isn't rated for outdoor use, but that's all the store had the day I was filming, so I just put them in temporarily and now I'm swapping all those out. But just build them with the blue ones, save yourself the work. So now for the bench, I'm planing down some more 4x4s to that same 3 inch thickness. And then the outer frame of the seat is going to be framed with these 4x4s instead of a 2x2 because this could potentially support like the weight of 4 bodies. And at just over 6 feet long, the 2x2s would not be nearly enough support. So then, the same way I did all the other pieces, I'm just putting in some more 2x2 spindles using some pocket holes.
And that's a completed seat. Time to assemble this bench. So I just screwed on the legs the same way I did on the chairs. The only difference with this one is I'm actually gonna use a couple of these five and a half inch long structural lag bolts. I put two of these into each end so that it can support a lot more body weight than the chairs. One last change on the bench, instead of doing the three two by two cross members, I just used one two by four instead and for the same reason this is spanning the longer distance and the two by four will have more strength than the two by two. And after screwing in the backrest, that's a structurally completed bench. So one last thing to build for this patio set, I'm going to make this little end table that also doubles as a cover for the propane. So I used some 4x4s and some 2x4s just to make up the mainframe for the end table. And then I just have some offcut pieces of cedar and I'm screwing these into the 4x4s to be a backer board for some paneling I'm going to nail in here. So I have a bunch of these clear cedar tongue and groove short offcut pieces from my sauna build. And I'm just cutting up some of these to the right length. Then I can use my 15 gauge nailer and just run these along those backer boards I just installed to close in this end table. By the way, if you want to learn more on how to install this tongue and groove paneling without having any exposed nail heads for a really clean look, you can watch my hour and a half long sauna video right here. So now I'm going to make a tabletop, so I just have some cut up pieces of clear cedar 2x6. And I'm just going to join these together with the factory edge because it's fairly square and I don't have a jointer to make this any better. So I drilled in some pocket holes and then I'm going to use some pocket hole screws and some glue to hold these together. I also made the pieces of 2x6 a few inches too long so that I could just cut the whole thing to my final dimension as one piece. This will ensure a perfectly flush edge. By the way, if you don't have some sort of track jig for your circular saw, you're missing out on a whole world. It makes straight cuts super fast and easy, and it's honestly one of my most used tools. With the tabletop cut to its final size, I just gave it a good sand with some 120 grit and put that same 8th inch round over bit around all the edges. So instead of rigidly securing the tabletop, I'm going to put this on a couple hinges. So I just traced on a rough hinge location and then I'm using a straight flute bit in my palm router. And countersinking the hinges down into the frame so that the tabletop isn't slanted from that extra width of the hinge. And then I can screw the tabletop into the other side of the hinges and I have a fully accessible propane end table. Alright, on to the final step of this build. So I have this tinted decking oil from Osmo. I think this color is Bankurai, but I can't be sure it's kind of covered up. Either way, it looks really nice on clear cedar, it just kind of deepens the tone and still keeps that cedar color. So I applied this over all of my pieces, just laying it on liberally with a stain applicator brush. And then after it soaked in for about 20 minutes, I'd just come back with some shop towels and just wipe away as much of the excess as possible. And it's simple as that, I just repeated this on all of the pieces. So this decking oil leaves a really nice kind of matte satin finish. And unlike a polyurethane, you don't have to worry about any brush strokes or anything. And you don't have to worry about it chipping off after being outside for a couple of years. All you have to do is reapply when it starts to fade, other than that, it's fully protected. And now the finishing touch for this patio set. I ordered these cushions online to the exact specs of my chairs. And this build is now fully done.
So normally I'd just take this in my backyard and do a real world shoot for the ending. But this channel is all about progression and growth, so instead of bringing this to nature, I'm going to pull a real YouTube move and bring nature to my shop. So it's really hard to translate the magic through video, but this has got to be one of the coolest things I've ever made. When you're sitting in here, it legitimately feels like you're at some Caribbean beach resort thanks to over 70 plants, about half artificial and half real. And some added sound effects makes it even more immersive. Of course this setup is only temporary because I'm going to need my shop back, but for a few weeks this is an amazing way to escape the greyest time of the year. But like everything, it's best enjoyed among friends. So building the log fire table and the patio set had a total cost of about $4,000 Canadian, but you could cut that almost in half by just using regular cedar instead of clear cedar. And then building this entire set for the ending cost me about $6,000. Believe me, I would have spent a lot more if this was a permanent thing, but it was really just to make this video as cool as it could possibly be. And I try to do that in every video, so if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. Once I take this set down, I have no use for all these plants, so I've actually made a deal with a local business to sell them to you guys. You can follow me on my Instagram at DrewBuildStuff for updates on when those are available. Thanks so much for watching my video, and I'll see you next time.